So first, uh, LoRa. So LoRa is really complementary to existing IoT communication technologies. But LoRa is unique in that it's a long range, um, but obviously at the cost of bandwidth. So it's designed for IoT use cases, uh, which require only very little bandwidth, very small messages. Um, but that also makes it really useful for um, uh, uh, devices that are usually asleep. Uh, there's no very little overhead to um, uh, have the device on the network. Uh, so it can basically be in deep sleep most of the time. And when a message needs to be sent, it just wakes up, sends the message, and goes back to sleep. And that really makes it complementary to other IoT technologies. It's not a replacement. Uh, in fact, we also see um, um, uh, end devices that both have a Wi-Fi transceiver as well as uh, LoRa, and, and only enable Wi-Fi if they need a high throughput. LoRa um, can be used in a license-free spectrum, and um, the thing is that the license-free spectrum is not globally harmonized. It's not like a Wi-Fi 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, uh, where Wi-Fi and Bluetooth make use of, um, which is globally harmonized. That is unfortunately not the case with uh, sub-gigahertz frequencies. And that means that in different regions, you have to use different frequencies. And to make that easy, um, LoRaWAN has a regional parameters. That's a specification. Uh, for each region where LoRaWAN is supported, and that's in 150 countries, uh, you can find all the frequencies um, uh, for that region. And your end device, as well as a network server, um, make sure that this all works and it's all part of the regulation. So usually you don't really have to think about this, um, but it's important uh, in case you want to um, design and ship devices uh, to different regions, because then you need to have two versions for the US and the European market, for example. So then the modulation. Uh, LoRa uses a chirp spread spectrum modulation. And the main characteristic of that is that there is a bandwidth in which the communication symbols are modulated. And that means that there is a center frequency. Uh, and around that center frequency, there are symbols uh, modulated, and you see that here on the right in a, a spectrogram. Um, so you see those symbols, and the bandwidth is quite high. It's um, typically 125 kilohertz. And that makes it different from, for example, uh, a narrowband waveform, which chooses a center frequency and then um, uses that single frequency to send uh, data. Um, that makes it uh, the, the spread waveform makes it robust to interference um, because um, only if there would be another signal that would make use of the same bandwidth at the same time, uh, exactly following the same pattern of these symbols, only then you would see interference. Um, so LoRa is super robust to interference. Actually, uh, the chirp spread spectrum uh, modulation uh, is also used by whales and dolphins and bats. Uh, so they also use it in nature uh, to communicate with each other, but also to uh, use um, to, to find uh, their, their prey. Um, and uh, this also works over very long distance. So um, uh, that's, that's where the chirp spread, spread spectrum comes from. So looking a bit into the, in the modulation itself, um, when uh, an end device sends a message, it sends eight of those chirps. So you see them here on the left. Uh, then there are two down chirps. Uh, so that's the other way around. And then uh, there are, again, um, more up chirps with the data. And this is an indication for the receiver uh, that there is data coming. So it's like a small chirp, it's like an announcement saying, hey, there's data coming, I want to send you something. On the demodulation side, so on the receiver side, um, the inverse happens. So there's dechirping, and then there is a spectral analysis uh, to figure out what the symbols were that were transmitted by the sender. Uh, 
And so I'm saying sender and receiver, uh, not necessarily end device and gateway or network. Because the beauty of LoRaWAN is that this modulation and the demodulation is so simple that it can also be carried out by the end device. So by your very cheap, low power end device, it uses the very same technology for both directions of messaging. Um, and that also makes LoRa unique. Um, so there are LoRa devices and LoRa gateways. The difference between the end device and a gateway is that a gateway can listen on multiple frequencies at the same time. So they have multi-channel and that's why it's called a concentrator. And an end device can only do one. But the modulation from device to gateway and from gateway to end device, that is just LoRa. Um, we call the transport from uh, end device to gateway, we call that uplink. And from gateway to end device, that is downlink. So that's, that's important to remember. Then in LoRa, there is a, uh, another important term, and that is the spreading factor. And a spreading factor indicates the number of data bits per second, the, the symbols, that are modulated uh, per time unit. So the higher the spreading factor, basically the slower the communication is. And you see that here also in this image. And um, increasing the spreading factor increases the time that it takes to send a message. And that obviously uh, needs more power on the end device to send the message. A lower spreading factor um, has shorter range. Uh, it has less time on air, so it takes less time to send the message. And that's obviously better for the device's battery. Uh, and that also means that the data is transported faster, so the data rate is higher. And this is a choice. This is a choice that you make on the end device uh, and on the gateway, uh, what the spreading factor is um, that you use for communication. And this is always a trade-off. There is no single spreading factor that is best for your use case. Um, and that is why LoRaWAN has a mechanism called adaptive data rate. Adaptive data rate is choosing the best spreading factor uh, in a particular scenario. So if the end device is close to a gateway, um, the end device can use a higher data rate or a lower spreading factor. Uh, to communicate. Uh, and if the device is further away, then you would typically go for a higher spreading factor and uh, a lower data rate uh, to ensure that the data is received by the receiving end. Adaptive data rate is an algorithm um, that can uh, measure the uh, signal-to-noise ratio. And uh, based on the signal-to-noise ratio or the link quality, the network can instruct an end device to change the data rate, for example, to increase it. Um, and that is really powerful in, in LoRaWAN, to automatically, dynamically adjust the data rates and thus uh, optimize battery life and link quality. LoRa in the license spectrum, in the unlicensed spectrum, uh, sorry, also uh, has a, uh, something that, that you need to consider is the duty cycle and the time on air. And that is a, uh, that differs from region to region. So for example, in the European Union, uh, there is a duty cycle, and a duty cycle is expressed in a percentage of time that your end device can transmit. And the rest of the time, it has to be silent. Um, in the US, there is no such limit on the duty cycle, but there is one on the dwell time. And that is uh, the time that it takes to send the message. Uh, there are differences in the subbands and everything, and again, this is all specified in the regional parameters, and your end device tag and your network uh, already contains these tables and takes care of this. But it's important to note uh, when you're deploying use cases. This also is the, the main reason why you cannot uh, have voice calls over LoRa, for example, because then you need continuous transmission, and that is not possible, uh, not only for battery life, but also because of the duty cycle. So an example is, um, let's say you have uh, a band, uh, the first band, band one, which has a uh, limitation of, or a duty cycle of 
And in band two, there is a uh, duty cycle of 40%. Um, there are two channels in band two. Uh, so that in total, there are three frequencies. And if on each of these frequencies, the duty cycle would be 20%, then that means that in total, the device can use frequency hopping. So it can choose a different frequency um, and has a, a time on air of 60%. So that's an example. And end devices, they use this frequency hopping, not only because it's mandatory, but also to optimize the channel utilization. And again, this is typically only applicable to European deployments of LoRaWAN. In the US, uh, there is no duty cycle, uh, and also in many other regions in Asia and in Australia, um, but there is dwell time or there are other limitations. Apart from the uh, legal framework and the legal limitations uh, that you have in different regions, uh, you can also have limitations set by the network operators. And this is common for public operated networks that are uh, provided by a traditional carrier. Uh, you can have prepaid plans for the number of messages that your device can send per month or per day, for example. Uh, and sometimes for network optimization, there could be uh, another policy. So, for example, in the Things Network, which is a free community network, LoRaWAN network, for, um, for optimization and for overall network capacity, uh, we also have guidelines. Um, they don't apply to private networks. If you deploy a private network with your gateways and your network server, you only have to um, uh, take care of the uh, regulations in your area. But don't waste any airtime. It's not only for the network capacity, but it really is also the battery life uh, of your end device that is, um, that, is, that is influenced by the spreading factor, the data rate that you use. So we have a calculator. If you go to the thingsnetwork.org slash airtime dash calculator, you can find there a very small, simple uh, calculator where you can enter the uh, size of the payload that you want to send and the spreading factor, and then it shows you how much milliseconds, milliseconds it takes to send a message. And if you need two or three seconds to send a message, that obviously um, uh, draws more battery power than uh, a higher data rate or a lower spreading factor.